Prime Minister, I see you have already mastered the essential craft of the European politician, namely the ability to say one thing in this chamber and a very different thing to your home electorate. You have spoken here about free trade and amen to that. Who would have guessed, listening to you just now, that you were the author of the phrase British jobs for British workers and that you have subsidised where you have not nationalised outright swathes of our economy, including the car industry and many of the banks? Perhaps you would have more moral authority in this House if your actions matched your words. Perhaps you would have more legitimacy in the councils of the world if the United Kingdom were not going into this recession in the worst condition of any G20 country. The truth, Prime Minister, is that you have run out of our money. The country as a whole is now in negative equity. Every British child is born owing around £20,000. Servicing the interest on that debt is going to cost more than educating the child. Now, once again today, you try to spread the blame around. You spoke about an international recession, international crisis. Well, it is true that we are all sailing together into the squalls, but not every vessel in the convoy is in the same dilapidated condition. Other ships used the good years to caulk their hulls and clear their rigging, in other words, to pay off debt. But you used the good years to raise borrowing yet further. As a consequence, under your captaincy, our hull is pressed deep into the waterline under the accumulated weight of your debt. We are now running a deficit that touches 10% of GDP, an almost unbelievable figure. More than Pakistan, more than Hungary, countries where the IMF has already been called in. Now, it's not that you're not apologising. Like everyone else, I've long accepted that you're pathologically incapable of accepting responsibility for these things. It's that you're carrying on, willfully worsening our situation, wantonly spending what little we have left. Last year, in the last 12 months, 100,000 private sector jobs have been lost, and yet you created 30,000 public sector jobs. Prime Minister, you cannot carry on forever squeezing the productive bit of the economy in order to fund an unprecedented engorgement of the unproductive bit. You cannot spend your way out of recession or borrow your way out of debt. And when you repeat in that wooden and perfunctory way that our situation is better than others, that we're well placed to weather the storm, I have to tell you, you sound like a Brezhnev era apparatchik giving the party line. You know, and we know, and you know that we know that it's nonsense. Everyone knows that Britain is worse off than any other country as we go into these hard times. The IMF has said so. The European Commission has said so. The markets have said so, which is why our currency has devalued by 30%, and soon the voters too will get their chance to say so. They can see what the markets have already seen, that you are the devalued Prime Minister of a devalued government. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Hannan is next. It's instructive, Mr. Speaker, to compare the American and European constitutions. The US Constitution is 7,200 words long. The European, in the form of the Lisbon Treaty, is 78,000 words long. The American Constitution is concerned with broad principles, such as the balance between federal and state jurisdictions. The European equivalent busies itself with such minutiae as policy on space exploration and the status of refugees. The American Declaration of Independence holds out the promise of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. The European equivalent, the Charter of Fundamental Rights and Freedoms, guarantees our right to strike action, affordable housing and free health care. The one is about the freedom of the individual, the other about the power of the state. All nations, all unions grow according to the DNA that was encoded at their conception. It was the good fortune of the American Republic to be founded in a popular revolt against a remote government and therefore to impregnate its institutions with a sympathy for the maximum dispersal of power. The European Union's tragedy is that it was founded from the opposite imperative. Line 1 of Article 1 of the Treaty of Rome commits us to establish an ever closer union. Our present doom was ordained from the first. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Hannan. Mr. President, one in five Greeks is now unemployed. 60,000 small firms have closed in the last year. The economy, which was scheduled to contract by 3% in 2011, has contracted by 6%. And there is no end in sight as long as Greece remains in the euro. There is uh, austerity and poverty and deflation without end. I noticed in the debate this morning that it seems to be dawning on some of our colleagues on the left that they have picked the wrong side that they are lining up with the uh, establishment, the bondholders and the banks against ordinary workers in Greece. That this bailout money is going to rescue some very wealthy individuals from the consequences of their mistakes, but that the repayment is going to come from ordinary taxpayers. That's what happens when you base your whole policy on signalling your disapproval of nationalism. That's what happens when you take a position based on doing the opposite of people that you don't like. But it's never too late to come to your senses, my friends. Joy shall be in heaven more over one sinner that repenteth than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. If you think this message is important and should be viewed by others, please share it. Share it to Facebook, share it to Twitter. Also be sure to like and favorite the video. By doing so, it will rise in listings and will have the opportunity to be viewed by others. Help us get the message out to the national and international stage. And also please subscribe to this channel, The Truth is Full of Lies.